Happy, ha- can I say happy Halloween in church? I'm gonna, happy Halloween. And so it's good to be with you. If you're a guest in our house today, both here in Montgomeryville, wanna welcome you to church. Uh, man, we're, we're happy to have you, have you with us. We're in the middle of a, a series. And so you've never been to church before. Maybe you've never been to church like this. We sing a couple songs and then we spend 30 to an hour, 30, I'm just, an hour, something like that in between talking through God's word. And so I got, I got a countdown in the back. I got about 30 minutes and we are, we're talking through a topic that I think if you're a, a follower of Christ or not, you'll take some, you can take something from. I'm talking about the, the topic of influence. Everybody wants to have influence in, in their lives. We, we took this term influencer from, from culture. If you don't, you don't live under a rock, you know what this is. It's famous people or people that have gained, gained enough fame where companies want them to sell their products to people. So if they wear it, it's deemed, it deemed cool. And, you know, I told you last week, whether you agree with that or like that or are jealous of that, that people can make money, that attribute, that quality has existed since the dawn of, of time. It's the ability to get somebody to believe or follow something based on your, your example. And so we don't sell Jesus, right? Like we're not salespeople, uh, but we do, we do share Jesus. And so last week I told you, listen, when it comes to influence, when it comes to sharing your faith, you're not given influence, you, you gain it. You don't get saved and go, okay, now I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Everybody will follow me because I'm saved now. Oftentimes, people want to sit back and they want to see what, what you're doing. They want to they see it. They want to see your consistency. They want to see your integrity. We talked about that last week. It's, it's gained. It's not, it's not given. And so I, I, I want to go through, continue to go through these eyes of, of, of influence. Today, I, I want to call it uh, interconnection. And so it would have been better just to call it friendships, but I needed it to be, be I. And so inter, interconnection, right? I'm type A, it just makes sense. And so, and it was in that article that I told you about. So interconnection, but it's all about, all about friendships. I, I wrote this in my notes, right? Uh, influence takes what I would call proximity, or you got to be close, right? So, so some of you already don't have influence because you don't live close to anybody that needs to know Jesus. What I mean by live, you don't do life, you, you, you don't spend time, you, you, you're not aware at work, you, you don't go to school, like you're, you're just not around anybody to influence. One of the worst things for a Christian is for a Christian to only know Christians. Nothing worse, that's like living in Arkansas, if you know what I'm talking about. A bunch of inbred, right? By the time you get to the second generation, looks nothing like, you're like, where'd that kid come from, right? Nothing like Jesus. And so you're inbred, right? In fact, Jesus says, watch this. I want to I show you what I would call a statement of desired influence, right? Sorry if you're from Arkansas. It's just true. And so uh, a statement of desired influence. Matthew chapter 5, right? I love when a joke hits like that. Like, you know, somebody's sitting. I'm just going to keep going. But Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, he gives... He gives a thought about influence to, to, his, to his church. Watch what he says. He says, you're the salt of the earth. You ever hear this, this one? But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So he's he trying to make a point. Salt is meant to add flavor, to preserve. It's meant to make a difference. You know what happens when you have too much salt? If you're salt and I'm salt and we're only salt and we're putting salt together, well, if you have food and you put too much salt on it, you know what happens to you? you die. That's what happens. You get high cholesterol. You have heart problems. This is what happens in so many churches. You have too much salt all together with no point. Then he goes on to say this. Watch this. He says, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gets life to everyone in the house. In the same way, he says, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Go out into the world and be a light. The problem is too many of us are just lights with each other. Sunlight's good in in, in a little bit, but if you get too much sunlight, right, you sit out too much, what happens? You get sunburn, you get cancer, you die. That's what happens. Too much salt, you die. Too much light, you die. You die. You, You tracking? Too much church, too much hanging out with only church people, too much talking Christianese, too much talking about how bad the world is, too much isolation. Guess what happens to you spiritually? You die. It's why so many people lack any type of excitement when it comes to their faith. Because coming into this room and singing the same seven songs that we sing 
and listening to a guy yell at you like a lunatic for 30 minutes and never doing anything else besides that and going out into the world. That's why it seems boring. That's why so many times you're like, I don't want to come to church. I got a million other things that I could do with this time because you have too much salt, too much light. You die. In fact, I love what it says about Jesus because Jesus was the best friend that anybody ever had. I mean, the Bible says Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So if you want to see what type of people Jesus was friends with and what type of friends friend he was, you just go to Scripture. And I love what it says about, about Jesus in Scripture because if this wasn't true, if you shouldn't be friends with people outside the church and influencing people outside the church, then you would find Jesus saying that. What you, what you would see Jesus saying is come, get cleaned up, join a club, stay in a group, we'll add people in here, we'll ignore the world, we'll yell at the world, we'll be mad at the world, that's what we'll do. But you don't see Jesus doing that. In fact, Jesus was accused in the book of Matthew chapter 11 through his own words. He says, the son of man, he came eating and drinking. And they say, he's a glutton and a drunkard. They called him what? A friend of tax collectors and sinners. You're not called a friend unless you're spending time with people. He goes on in Mark chapter 2 to explain this whole situation. I, I love this. The, the Bible says that once again, Jesus went beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, the tax collector, sitting at the booth. Watch what he says to Levi. Follow me. What? what? Levi is the worst. Like, everybody hated Levi, right? And Jesus walks by. That's why I love Jesus. He's not a politician. If you're a politician, you're not picking Levi to join your political party. He's the worst, but he walks by Levi, and he doesn't even, he doesn't say, hey, man, we're going to have to make some changes. You're going to have to stop stealing. You're going to have to stop. He just goes, hey, follow me. And, and the Bible says that because Jesus was the type of person that he was, that Levi gets up and follows him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate, and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, so if you're not a church person, this means the church people? Church people were always mad at Jesus. They said, why is he eating with sinners and tax collectors? Why is he friends with people like this? What does Jesus say? It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous. What does he say? I've come to call sinners. So here's my question for you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, how many real friendships do you have with people outside of your faith? How many people are seeing Jesus through the time, the energy, the effort, the grace, the forgiveness, through, through your willingness to, to give and not get anything in return? How many people in your life currently that are outside of your faith are experiencing the love of Jesus for, through a friendship with you? Can, can I tell you what, what's sad about most Christians? Most of us that have been in church for a long time, most of us would say, probably zero. Most of us would say most of our friendships, based on the way that the culture of the church is built, most of our friendships, most of our energy, most of our time, most of our thinking, most of our decisions, mostly everything that we do is birthed by our desire to be in what I would call the Christian subculture. And we miss out on being salt. With too much salt, we die. Or too much light, we die. Spiritually, we're apathetic because we don't see the significance of Jesus making us the type of friend that he needs us to be. So I had a few thoughts on why so many of us are not influential and how to be an influential friend to people that don't know Jesus. And I just want to give them to you. And this one's been the first one I'm going to spend most of my time. i got three, but I'm going to spend most of my time on the first one. So with this one, this point, I just want to, when this one takes like 20 minutes, I don't want you to look at your watch and go, dude, he's only on point one. Because once I get to point two and three, we're sprinting, right? Like to the end. But I want you to hear this one because this is, this is my number one issue with church. And I got lots of them. But this is the number one issue that I have with church. The number one thing that I think keeps Christians from looking like Jesus. I wonder if anybody has ever accused you of hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. Being friends. Not being influenced by them. Because you notice Jesus what didn't go and live it up right? Get drunk and party on because he's hanging out. I'm, I'm being salt. No, he went into people's parties and he influenced and he changed and people's lives were different, right? But I think the number one reason so many of us are different than this, the very first thing that I've seen in churches is in churches, we tend to isolate ourselves. 
So I want to encourage you. You need to integrate in your culture instead of isolate away from them. I have this term, this term, and I don't know if I made it up, but I call it the Christian bubble. You know what I'm talking about? I've been in church my whole life, my whole life. I'll give you the cycle of the Christian bubble. You get saved at some point, so, some point in your life. Like you, some of you were raised in church. So I'll say, like, when did you get saved? You're like, I don't know. I've been going to church my whole life, which, which by the way, if that's your answer to being saved, we're going to have an altar call in a couple minutes. Probably want to lock that down, right? Because I went to church my entire life, but I was not saved until I was 18 years old on the steps of the Hershey Arena at Youth Convention. I've told you this story before. I was radically saved in that moment. And I did not deserve it, but I can tell you the day. I can tell you the preacher. I can tell you what I was trying to go do. I can tell you what Jesus did. Was I perfect after that? No, I was 18. I was still an idiot. I'm 41. I'm still pretty much the same idiot, right? <laughs> but I was saved in that moment. All of us have that moment. We come and we get saved. And then what happens is we begin to become disciples, hopefully. We say, you know what? I want to become more like Jesus. And this is, this is a good desire. I want to follow Jesus. I want to listen to Jesus. I want to study his word, right? Most of the time, though, we get lost here. For some reason, the more that we study, the more that we know, the more that we study, the more that we know, the less that we go. The less we, we are involved in our world, the longer we go to church, we start to have kids in church, we raise up second generation kids, and we, we begin to have different ideas of our family, and we forget what it feels like to not to not, not be saved or raise our kids, and all of a sudden you become a disciple, but you go from a disciple to the dreaded church person. And the church person has indoctrinated themselves and involved themselves in what I would call the Christian bubble. What's the Christian bubble? The Christian bubble is the point that you get where you begin to believe what's out there is bad and evil and wrong, and your main job is to keep yourself safe in this little biodome, you know, Pauly, whatever his name was, and, and Adam, Adam, remember, remember that movie, The Biodome, and you just keep yourself safe, and you, you know what I'm talking about? You get the air, it, it, the perfect Christian air coming in, and the perfect Christian music, and all the perfect kids come together, and there's no evil kids out there, and you control everything around you. You know what I'm talking about, the bubble? Like, I, I, years ago, I did a sermon series called Satan Roast the Church, just a few years ago, and uh, I, I just imagine oftentimes how much Satan laughs at how dumb we are. Like, I think Satan laughs at offering time at church. I think he loves when Christians are like scared to give and obsessed with their money. I think he goes, this is great. They're never going to see God do what he wants to do because you're obsessed with your money. I think he loves when Christians don't know their word. So he sends them something that's so easy for God's word to take care of and they stress out and they freak out because they never read their Bible, but they know all sorts of other things they probably shouldn't know about the earth. And I think he loves that. I think he loves the bubble. I think he loves when we, when we begin to talk about the world as if we're not supposed to love them. When we talk about how evil they are, when we talk about how wretched they are, when we talk about how they're trying to change us. And, and I, love, I even think to myself, he loves it when the church starts to age, because here's how you know you're an aging church, when the majority of your conversation exists and consists about the evilness of the world right now. That's what old people do. You know what I'm talking about? Every generation that's come, the world is falling apart. That's, no. You're just dying, right? <laughs> I'm dying now. And so now I know I'm aware. When, I, when you're a kid, you don't give a crap. You're just going, right? But when you get older, you're dying. And so the world is evil and it's falling apart. And you start to indoctrinate in the Christian, Christian bubble with Christian friends, Christian influences, Christian music, Christian theme parks, Christian nights, Christian worship, like all this Christian thing, Christian t-shirts. You know what I'm talking about? When I was a kid, I had a shirt that said, if, if, in case of rapture, you can have my shirt. Nothing says you're a dork like wearing that. <laughs> I remember I got, like, I got edgier when I was 13 years old, and my mom and dad, there was this one shirt at the Christian bookstore. It was called Hackman's, the Christian bookstore. And so the Christian Barnes and Nobles. And uh, I, it, said, it said, God's last name is not damn on it. And I was like, can I get that? And I'll be a light to my, to my school. Really what I was thinking is I get to wear a curse word on my shirt, right? <laughs> And you just have this, this culture. And, and, then, and then you almost don't even know how to relate to people outside the bubble. Right? And then, and, then, and then you start talking about people outside like Jonah did to Nineveh. You remember? Jonah's main job was to be a prophet for God. His main message was repentance and forgiveness. That's what he was called to do. 
And when God said, I want you to go to the worst city in the world at, that, at this point, Nineveh, and tell them if they repent, I'll heal their land and forgive them, what did Jonah do? I'm not going there. Those people are evil. I'm going in the complete opposite direction. And I just think to myself, because I, I feel like, you know, we're talking about a pandemic and all this stuff going on. This is a pandemic problem in the church. It just is. The longer you're a Christian, the less you forget what it feels like. And I started thinking, how can I explain this? And for some of you, it's a really easy explanation. I just want to tell you, if I had the same mentality that you had 15 years ago, right? I started having kids. My kid is 14 years old. And when I had them, I started realizing how much I love them. And I found in the Bible somewhere that my main goal was to keep them safe. That's not in the Bible, right? And I'm going to protect them and all these things. Could you imagine some of you, if you'll just go back to who you were before you came to Jesus? If I was trying to create a culture and a church where I wanted to keep my kids safe and you walked in here all hung over, marriage me messed up, tattooed, smelly like B.O., right? Not, not looking like a Christian at all. What do you think my reaction would have been if I'm living the same uh, understandings and ideals that so many Christians are when you walked in and my kids were here and I was trying to keep them safe? You got to find a different church. Because if you come here, this is no longer a safe environment for me to raise my kids in. I'm trying to teach them about wholesomeness and morality, and you are far from it. You know what happened when you walked into Journey Church? You looked around and you went, them too? This is the place for me. <laughs> you looked up on the stage and you went, him too? This is the place for me. See, the problem with so many of us is that we, we have decided that we want to, we want to isolate ourselves Instead of integrate, and the, the problem with it is you can't find that in Scripture. Like, we, we, we know Scripture until Scripture attacks and convicts our comforts. You cannot find that in Scripture. In fact, watch what the Bible says that Jesus says. He says this in John 17, last prayer before he goes to the cross. Watch what he says. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. You know why he's praying for protection? Because he's sending you into a fight. My prayer is not that you protect them and keep them safe and never let them go through anything. I'm going to send them in and I'm going to give, you every, give them everything they need to overcome. Then the Bible says they're not of the world even as I am not of the world. As you sent me into the world, I am sending them back into the world. And so I just want to encourage you with a few thoughts. I started thinking about this. We should want to, we should want to integrate in our culture. Just think logically. Logically. I'll give you two L's. Uh, two really simple ones. L local and loyal. You should write these down. If your goal is to, is to influence the culture and build friendships where you live, which that should be what you do, right? You should be called where you live. You should be called where your kids go to school. You should be called in your life. That, that's what you're on mission, right? You're going to live with a local mindset. You're going to love the city, the neighborhood, the school district, the public servants, the sports league. You're going to be involved, engaged, and generous. That's how you build influence in your town. In fact, some of you say, is that important? Well, Jesus said, or Jeremiah, God told Jeremiah in 20, Jeremiah 29, he says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. In, in other words, you're leaving Jerusalem and I'm allowing it to be destroyed and you're traveling a thousand miles to Babylon. But when you get there, I don't want you to whine about how evil it is and on how godly it is. I want you to, to build good businesses. I, I want you to serve people well. And I want you to pray for the prosperity of the town that you live in because if it prospers, guess what? You prosper. You're going to be lo local and you're going to be loyal. You're going to put down roots. You're going to go to the same places. You're going to root for the local teams. Man, go to the freaking football games on Friday night. Go, go. I, I don't have kids that play. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. That's where the town shows up. And I want to be involved in my, in my town. I want to be local and I want to be loyal, right? I want to serve. I want to see the prosperity of my, my city. I want you to stop whining and I want to stop whining about how evil that this world is. I started, I started trying to figure this out because I'm like, how can I say this unoffensively? And I couldn't. But I, it's, it's, it's disturbing to me. It just is. Now you can go like one generation hungry, second generation that didn't build the business, deals with the success and enjoys it, third generation kills it. So first, some of you first generation been here for, for, for many years and now you're having kids and if we're not careful, we will not transfer 
that mentality of lostness, of hopelessness, of brokenness, of serving and sacrifice in this world because we're isolating instead of integrating. Because we're not pushing. And this is not, listen, this is not a schooling thing. This is not a where you live thing, although I think you should all live in Phoenix. I'm just kidding. And so this is a why thing. Why do you do what you do? Why do you raise your kids the way you raise them? What decisions do you make? What's the reason behind it? That's a great answer or question, by the way. Why am I doing it? Am I doing it because I want them to have influence or am I making the decision because I want them to be safe? And I've told you before, safety is an awful goal for your kids. If you want to up the chances that your kids will walk away from the Lord one day, teach them that the main job of a parent is to keep them safe. Because one day you will teach them the heavenly father is, is the best parent you could ever have. And I got to tell you something. His main goal for them is not safety. His main goal is to teach them that even though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, they don't have to fear any evil. If your main goal is safety, as soon as God doesn't keep them safe, what are they going to say? God's not good. God's not good. He doesn't do what my parents taught me he would do. So I started thinking about my own life because our goal was local and loyal. Let's move somewhere. Let's be called there. Let's stay there. Even when they raise our taxes, let's stay there. Even though when I get a personal bill, whatever the heck that is, just to live in this town, let's stay there. Even when they don't open the schools up in time and everybody else's school district is open there, let's stay there. Even when they make us wear masks, let's stay there. Let's not whine about how hard it is and how difficult it is. In fact, let me be quiet and let me read scripture. Let me see if I have grounds to whine about difficulty. Oh, I don't. Let me go into scripture. Like in Philippians, Paul is literally locked up in prison. You know why he's locked up in prison? Because of his faith for Jesus. He will not deny him. He says, I'm not going to deny him. I'm going to stick up for him. And so they lock him up in prison. And he is awaiting trial to which he will go to. And Nero will behead him. All he has to do is de deny him. And the Bible says he's locked up in prison. If there was ever a time for somebody to isolate and be depressed and be miserable, it would be Paul. But he writes this, this book, this letter to the church of Philippi from prison in Rome. And I love what he says. He's in prison, and the Bible says that he is chained 24 hours a day to Roman guards. He's got Brutus and beefcake on him 24 hours a day. I mean, he, he, his, life cannot, his life is awful. He doesn't go to the bathroom without asking. Here's a guy who has lived his life for Jesus. And here's what he says. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. I love that. He says, as a, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone else that I am in chains for who? Who's it becoming clear to, by the way? Well, if you go all the way to Philippians chapter 4, the Bible says, all God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to whose household? Caesar's. The dude that's about to kill him, the, the guards that work for him, he says, I've been chained to them day in and day out. And instead of me whining about how I'm chained to them, my perspective has been changed and they're chained to me. Woo! Like instead of you looking and going, it's so hard, I'm chained to difficulty, my kids are chained to this, blah, blah, blah. Instead, what if I said, guess what? Phoenixville chained to my kids. My kids are a problem for the brokenness in Phoenixville. My kids are going to love and serve and influence. What if instead of us always being chained to difficulty, what if difficulty was chained to us? We're going to integrate, not isolate. N number two, let me just give you two more real quick. We're going to go real fast now. We're going to be a friend, not just friendly. So, here, so here's the problem. So many times in church, integration, right, instead of isolate, isolation, is like this drive-by thing, right? So when I, when I was a kid, they had this thing called servant evangelism. And you know what servant evangelism was? You figure out what the community is doing, and you go serve in what I would call drive-by Jesus, right? So you just you give an hour of your time. You, get, you put your shirts on from your church. You know what I'm talking about? You put, we get waters, maybe. You wrap the waters with the, with the Journey Church logo. You pass them out. You, know, you come back to church. We'll do this. Maybe you give them a pamphlet. We're giving a free drawing away at church. We're giving a ski do away next week. If you come for 16 people, get, a, you know, get my second born child, whatever. And, so, like, just, and it's like this drive-by fasting where it's like you're, you're being friendly, but you're not building friendships. See, because integration, the problem with integration 
is it shifts and changes your entire life. That's the problem. Living and being consistent locally and loyal, it, it shifts your decisions. It shifts in the way you, way you make decisions for your family. It shifts. And the problem is most of us don't want to invest the time that is needed to build our vengeance. So what do we do? We're going to be friendly. And that's, 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 a, that's not a bad thing. I'm going to pay for somebody's lunch. I'm going to wave to somebody today, you know, be nice. I'm going to let them go in front of me. I'm going to, you know, let's hold the door open for somebody. I'm going to be kind. And being friendly is a good thing, but being friendly, being a friend is different. And the Bible implies that Jesus was, it didn't say he was friendly with sinners. That, that would be different. That would be like when Jesus walks by and he, he doesn't strike them down. See their sin, strike them down. Woman caught in adultery, uh, kill her. Woman at the well, get rid of her. Demon possessed man, cast them off. The, the Bible implies that he's friends with sinners. That means, that means he sees people, he sits with people, he talks with people, he listens to people. He hangs out with them. He goes to their houses. He, he eats with them. That was significant, by the way, because in that culture, who you ate with, that was a signal of who you accepted. That's why they hated when Jesus ate with the, with the partiers, with the tax collectors, with the sinners, because in essence, Jesus was saying, I accept you. I accept you. I'm friends with you. And I, I just, the problem with so many of us is we don't take the time. We just don't. Because I got to tell you, when you're friends with somebody outside the church, even friends inside the church, but what I found in my own life is frustrating. It's disappointing sometimes. Sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes somebody talks to me about their life, and I, I've been a Christian for so long, and they're going through something, and I'm like, well, let's Google Dr. Phil for a second to see. <laughs> and so, sometimes it's just... I just don't have time. Yeah, like, you know, like, you just don't have, it's just time consuming. And I just, I want to encourage you, shift your life. Shift the focus of your life. Your, your, your focus of your life should be relationships. At the end of your life, that's all you have. Your influence through relationships. You're not, you're not going to worry. You're not going to talk about your house. You're not going to talk about your cars. You're not going to talk about all the things you spent your money on. It's going to be about your relationships. So you're going to be a friend. And the last one, I just want to encourage you with this talk. When you do look at somebody who's far from Christ, see a person, not a project. See, see a person, not a project, because here's what we'll do. Uh, then we'll stop and we'll try to tell them about Jesus and we want them, we want them to change overnight. <laughs> hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Like it will, every conversation will just lead into Jesus, right? We'll just weave back in. And it's, it's not even, it's like out, out of place. It's awkward, right? And why? Because we see a project. We, okay, well, I mean, we're like Joe was witness, car salesman, right? You ever talk to a Jehovah's Witness? You realize no matter what you say, they have a response because they practice. This is the way the conversation is going to go. Here's how you're going to steer it. They're going to say this. Boom, you're going to hit them with that. Right? You ever want to message a Jehovah's Witness? Google that conversation and then throw something in that completely confuses them. Because, listen, people are, are people, not projects. And here's what I found out in my own life. I'm going to see people like Jesus sees them, and I'm going to love people the way Jesus loves them, and I'm going to let him change them. I'm going to share the gospel through my life, not just through my conversation. But you don't get that. You don't get those moments. You don't get those opportunities until you spend the time to build real friendships, until you get out. Listen, saddest thing in the world is for your only good friends to be people that go to this church. That is, that, is, that is sad. The saddest thing in the world is for you not to spend time with people outside the church telling them about Jesus, not with your words, but through your life. Let them see Jesus. Best thing, I'm going to tell you what the best thing is. Of all of my years, the most emotional moments of this church for me have been when I've stood at the bat baptism and I, I baptize a neighbor or I baptize a mechanic or, you know, whatever. And I know years and years and years of conversation and years of being loyal and years of listening and years of making time and seeing, seeing the emotion of that moment and realizing that right there is so much more important than this right here. That, that, that's why you serve Jesus. 
That, that's why he saves you. He doesn't save you to get you to sit in a room. He saves you to, to send you. Amen? 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 Amen. Amen in Montgomeryville? All right, cool. Let's stand to your feet. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Relationships. Everything, everything in your life is about relationships. It's about Jesus. He, listen, he's the best friend that you could ever have. So we're just trying to reflect him. Just trying to reflect him. Think about how he was. He meets a woman at the well all by herself, and he's not embarrassed of her. He's even talked to, talked to her when the disciples come, come back. It's a friend. He meets a man that's in a cemetery that's possessed by a demon and he can't stop cutting himself. And the entire city has defined him and stayed away from him. And Jesus sees him. And he's not embarrassed. He's not disgusted. He's not ashamed. The Bible says he touches him and he heals him. The woman with the issue of blood, she, she meets Jesus and her life is different. The woman caught in adultery, he stands in front of the ones who try to kill her. He's a friend. He's a, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And he's here. And some of you, this is where this starts. So I've talked to, to Christians about loving people like Jesus, but the, the truth is the star of the day is Jesus and his love and his grace. That's why we're here. That's why we sing. That's why we serve. It's why we give is Jesus and our hope and our prayer is every week that somebody maybe just like you in Montgomeryville somebody like you would walk into this room and through through worship through the word through the hands and feet of people who have served through the kids uh, that your kids being dropped off through those teammates that are that are watching that you would feel God's love for you that you would begin to have your heart softened some of you, your hearts have been so hardened to God. It's hardened because of your issues of your past and things that have been said to you. And you've even been, you, 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 you've said to yourself, if there was a God that loved me, he would never let this go on. But something's shifted in your spirit. Something's being softened. That's the presence of God. That's his power. And you can feel it. Because I remember I did. My heart was beating almost out of my chest and I could feel God's voice I didn't hear him but I felt him and I knew in that moment even though I grew up in church I didn't know him and I wanted to so I remember the pastor so just tell him you want a relationship with him I was a teenager and so I just Jesus I, I don't understand it all it's not always made sense to me I don't know what the future looks like and holds but Jesus I know I need you. And in that moment, he saved me. And he has done what he said he would do. He is a friend that has stuck closer than a brother. He's been with me through thick and thin. He's been with me through ups and downs. He has never quit on me. And he's here. And some of you, you've heard it before, but something different's happening here today. You're tired. You're weary. You're worried. You live your life with anxiety. It feels like you're imprisoned. But the Bible says Jesus has come to set the captives free. And he's here. And if you would just receive him, the Bible says if you would confess, call out to him and believe in your heart in Jesus. And he died on a cross for our sins. That he was placed in a tomb. And on the third day he rose in power and it's through him that we become a brand new person. And if you would receive that message, that he would come into your life. And he's here. I'm going to ask you a question. I don't know you. I never talked to you before. But you're here, and it feels like I'm talking to you right now. And you can feel the Spirit of God moving in your life. And you're to the point where you're ready for a change. If that's you all over this house, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. I'm not making you come forward. If you've been here before, you know we're going to pray together. But I want to, I want to know. I want to know that you're here. I want to pray with you as we close. Simple prayer. Jesus, come into my life. I need you. 
I need you. So that you here in Montgomeryville and you would say, hey, that, that's me. Uh, I need Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Would you just begin all over this place and in Montgomeryville, just shoot your hand straight towards heaven and say, hey, you're, you're talking to me right now. There's a hand right here. Is there anybody else? The hand over here, hand right here. I want you to do all over, all over this place. I just want you to begin to pray. If you're a Christian, would you just pray for this moment? If you're in Montgomeryville, just pray for this moment. Maybe you're not a praying person. You just talk to, talk to Jesus like he's your friend. <laughs> Jesus, come into my life right now. Here, here I am. I, I don't want to live my life anymore without you. I've tried and I've failed. So Lord, would you, would you come in and would you, would you do what you do? Would you heal? Would you change? Would you save? Would you transform? Father, would your voice begin to fill our heads, your voice of love, your voice of comfort, your voice of compassion, with the voice of the enemy, the one that lies to us, the one that's filled with shame and condemnation and tells us we can never change, Lord, would that voice be silenced? And would we leave this place a brand new person? Joy right now is filling them. The Bible talks about this peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, it's filling their life right now. Jesus, we thank you for what you've done, for what you continue to do. We love you. Lord, as we leave this place, Lord, we just want to continue to be people of influence. That, that's why the church is here. We're not here to come to a room, and Father, this is the extent of what we do, but Lord, we get filled up so we can be sent out. And Lord, we leave this place with the fire of the Lord burning inside of us. Every interaction is an opportunity. Every encounter is an opportunity. Lord, we want to build real friendships with this world. We want to show them your love, your compassion, your grace, your patience. Lord, thank you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray. One more time, church. Would you shout amen for me? Hey, before you go, we want you to know you are the reason we stream our service. If you joined us for your first or second time, fill out an online info card so we can meet you, answer any questions you might have, and help you get connected with a Journey Campus near you. Or if you gave your life to Jesus today, we would love to equip you with resources to help you with your new faith. If you don't live near a Journey Campus, we would love to connect you with a church in your area. Church Online is a great way for us to share our faith with our friends and learn about God's love but we know nothing can replace being a part of your local church family. In fact, God calls us to come together to serve others, grow in our faith, and help introduce people to Jesus. So send us a message. We'd love to help you find a church near you. Have a great rest of your week. We look forward to seeing you soon.